All right. Um, and the live stream, Ritaba? Yes, I'm doing that now. Um, and you're welcome to start if you like. Thank you. Is everyone in? Um, Mubashar, I'm sorry. I, were you able to admit Are everyone? Are they getting in? So consider it. Um, maybe it's the two minutes thing. Um, I've just admitted everyone. Great. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Matthew Keeley. I'm the Director of Youth Law Australia, uh, a, a community, a national community legal centre here in Australia. So today's topic is one after my own heart. Uh, as is customary, I'd like to acknowledge that Youth Law Australia and DTP and our friends are coming to you today uh, from the lands of the Bedical people of the York. Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to the 18th in our webinar series, which has sought to enhance the understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in the Australian context. Uh, remarkably, uh, our webinar series has become popular throughout the world, and we're joined today by guests from Africa, from the Indo Pacific, uh, from Europe. Uh, and the Americas. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Today's webinar is on the topic of children's rights and access to justice. As I said, something dear to my heart, as I do believe that access to justice is a case, well, routinely omitted from justice, legal and rights discussions, and yet it is such an important safeguard. In a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce you to our guests, uh, if I could ask you please to mute your sound and image um, to permit um, you know, greater performance of, of the Zoom for us all. Um, please place your questions and comments in chat. Uh, I will be turning to those after both speakers have presented and we'll be dealing with questions and comments in order. So maybe get your questions and comments in early. Um, and please pay attention to the chat as we'll be linking to various significant documents or report discussed uh, in the body of the chat. Thank you. Uh, I'd like now to introduce Tom Leofard. So Professor Tom Leofard is Vice Dean of Leyden Law School, and he holds the UNICEF Chair in Children's Rights at Leyden University, the Netherlands. He's the director of the master's program there in advanced studies in international children's rights. And he also coordinates the Leyden Summer School on international children's rights. Tom teaches and publishes widely on issues related to international children's rights, juvenile justice, child-friendly justice, deprivation of liberty of children, violence against children, and access to justice for children. He supervises PhD students from all over the world on various children's rights topics and has initiated the Leyden Children's Rights Observatory, an open access online platform for children's rights commentaries on the jurisprudence of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and other relevant bodies. Professor Leofard regularly works as a consultant for international organizations, including UN agencies, the Council of Europe and the European Union. He's also served as an advisor to the Dutch government on issues related to children's rights, juvenile justice, child protection, and family law. He was a member of the International Advisory Board of the United Nations Global Study on Children Deprived of Their Liberty. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I should let you know that today's session is being recorded and is also being live streamed on Zoom, which is maybe another reason why you may choose to uh, mute your sound and image. Uh, I'll hand you over to Professor Tom, Le Tom Leofard. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for uh, for uh, for your warm welcome. Um, greetings to you all. Greetings from uh, from Leiden University. It's very early in the morning here, um, but that uh, should not stand in the way um, of having a, a, a good discussion uh, and exchange uh, uh, this afternoon, this this morning depending on where you are. Um, I will try to share my screen now to see if that's going to work. Um, but 
I would like to connect child-friendly justice to, to access to justice. And um, access to justice for children, um, I mean, access to justice as such is not, not new, but um, for children, in, um, um, it gained attention um, throughout the past uh, 15, uh, 10 to 15 years. And you can really say that there is an, an international agenda um, today uh, around access to justice for children, but we are still in the transition from access to justice being, uh, um, um, in my view, a very crucial legal concept um, to um, access to justice being um, uh, a right that has real meaning for children, regardless of the context they are in. Um, so, so that is what my talk will be about. And I start with a very obvious remark, but a very important one is that we talk, when you talk about access to justice, we are talking about a right of children, um, children living across the globe, um, and, uh, and which is an inherent element of the human rights framework for children that emerged in the past century and has, um, has been gaining attention and also relevance since, since then. Um, why do I say this? Because access to justice ultimately revolves around accountability of those who bear responsibility to make children's rights work. It is a way for children to force themselves into the conversation, to gain attention in decision-making that is about them, either individually or uh, for children as a group, um, and to hold those who are responsible to, to account ultimately. Um, to live up to their obligations and, and also the expectations that come with it. And that is why this whole issue of access to justice is not, um, I mean, it's quite striking that it took so long before we started to talk about it. Over the past 33 years, since the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, a lot has happened, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, but we have seen domestication of children's rights. We've seen regional movements. We now also talk about non-state actors as duty bearers under the international children's rights framework. We see a connection, a very strong one between the sustainable development agenda and children's rights. And also a very important new feature, uh, relatively new is the international complaints procedure under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which gives children access to justice at the international level something that we did not have until 2011, 2014, when the optional protocol on the communications procedure for children entered into force. Yet, if you zoom in on where children are in, in the world on a daily basis, we see that there is still many big gaps between the law in theory and law in the books, uh, sorry, and practice. Um, and and, and, and I, I'm particularly concerned about what we could call the justice gap, is that there is still a big gap between um, acknowledging children as rights holders and really living up to that in terms of seeing children as, as equivalent, uh, seeing children as equal and include all children, um, uh, not making a distinction between our children and other children, for example. We have still serious issues with the visibility of children in our uh, decision making, either inter individually or, or, or at the group level. Um, you could say that we lack a truly child-centered approach in many different ways. And ultimately, also, we ha are constantly struggling with, with accountability. Um, so, so a lot of law reform, for example, but yet uh, still many gaps when it comes to the actual seeking of, of justice. Um, Effective remedies and also the right to an effective remedy, which is inherently related to access to justice for children, is therefore also critical. And that was already acknowledged by the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, in 2003, when it drafted its general comment on general measures of implementation, and it very clearly stated, well, if rights, if we want to have rights, uh, if we want to give rights meaning, then we need to talk about effective remedies. They must be available to address violations um, and, and that connects also to legal theory, uh, in which this was already recognized uh, way before that, that rights without remedies are actually basically purely symbolic. And the Commission, the commission of Human Rights at the UN level uh, started to pick this up and uh, also influenced by the UNDP and UNICEF uh, drafted a special 
document, which later also led to a resolution at the Human Rights Council level, in which access to justice for children was, was, uh, was discussed. And that uh, was defined in that particular do uh, document as the ability, as I put it here on the slide, to obtain a just and timely remedy for violations of rights as laid down in national and international norms. And that is what essentially access to justice is about. Um, and that is no, not so much different uh, when you compare children from adults. Um, access to justice is connected to this fundamental right to an effective remedy. It's an element of the rule of law. It is also included in the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 16 in particular. It revolves around accountability and inclusion of your, of your citizens. And it acknowledges for children, of course, very strongly uh, reaffirms in a way that children are rights holders. Yet, children suffer from specific challenges when we zoom in on the issue of access to justice. So even though children, and you could say that children have, like every other human being, the right to an effective remedy and the right to access to justice, but when you zoom in, you see that children suffer from specific challenges standing in the way of, um, of, uh, of access to justice. What are these specific challenges? They were acknowledged also internationally by the Human Rights Council, is that there are many still legal barriers for children to engage with justice at the domestic level. It depends, of course, on the specific role they have. Sometimes they are brought into the justice system by others, like a public prosecutor in the criminal justice context. But in the civil justice context, we see that there are many, many barriers. And that often relates to the, uh, the a still categorical exclusion um, of children from having legal capacity or legal standing. And then you see that across the globe in many civil law, family law systems included, you see that children actually cannot access to justice independently from those who are responsible for them. And that is not necessarily always a problem, but of course, particularly in the context of family law, you can very well imagine that there may be a conflict of interest. And what do you do then? So children do not automatically have the same legal status as adults. Of course, for children, there is also many socioeconomic conditions that may stand in the way, which relate to lack of resources. Um, uh, uh, but often also in relation to this, we have to acknowledge that the legal aid system uh, specifically for children is, is very limited. Uh, if it exists at all, it is not good. It is not good, not having the good quality and it's certainly not providing children with means to access justice. We also see that we have still a lot of traditional attitudes towards children and children's rights. And that also affects um, uh, uh, children, the, the acknowledgement that children have access to justice. If you don't acknowledge children as rights holders in the first place, then why should you talk about access to justice? But also a little bit more specifically, we see that, for example, boys can access justice in certain ways, but girls cannot because girls are not seen as equivalent to boys as not having rights at all, for example, or not having certain rights. Violence against children is not always seen as a problem in light of children's rights, and therefore, why should you bother about victims of violence? So all these things are related to cultural, but also traditional attitudes perceptions towards children, which ultimately could, in theory, but also in practice, lead to a lack of access to justice. In addition, we see that groups are excluded. Um, in my country, for example, we don't seem to bother at all about access to justice for children who have left the country with their parents and are now stuck in, in northern Syria, for example. We, we categorically exclude them from accessing justice to find a way back and to seek protection. Just one example, but I can give you many more. Another quite fundamental challenge that we see is that we don't invest in the empowerment of children. We don't invest in the legal empowerment of children. So often children don't know that they have a right to access to justice and that they, and they don't know how they should benefit from it. And that relates to a critical point that I would like to address now. And that is the lack of child sensitivity in many justice systems. Um, in different contexts um, uh, around the globe. Um, it starts, of course, with the very realistic um, uh, assumption 
that justice systems are not designed for children. They are already difficult for adults to engage with, but for children even more. And the question is, how do we deal with that? And ideally, maybe you want to reimagine your justice system, but we have to cope with the justice systems as they are. And often, of course, they have a very important function to play in society. So the question then is, how can you, as part of this access to justice agenda, make sure that children can actually effectively engage with the justice system if they want to, or if they are brought into it by others or because of circumstances. And that relates to what we call in Europe, at least, the concept of child-friendly justice. I'm not, so, I'm not, not such a big fan of the term child-friendly. I prefer child-sensitive or adjusted or, or appropriate, but I use it anyway because it is, it is actually the concept that we use in Europe and it has uh, that concept has also resulted in quite a, um, yeah, I would say sophisticated international legal framework that is now finding its way to the domestic legal systems in Europe and also beyond that. And I've started to inform also justice actors, not only the systems and the laws as such, but also the actors on how to make, or to be more sensitive to children um, in their systems. It is ultimately a concept that emerged out of international children's rights, um, supported by powerful jurisprudence coming from the European Court of Human Rights, legally binding jurisprudence, that started to inform this, this agenda and resulted ultimately in this concept that is meant to enable children to access and engage with justice systems. Um, traditionally, people tend to look at this as if this is about juvenile justice or criminal justice. But I would like to make the point very clearly that this is about justice systems um, uh, much uh, more uh, beyond uh, criminal justice. So including the migration system, including the family law system, including the child protection system, including all kinds of other justice processes in, that affect ultimately children. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure you can think of many others. Uh, but but it's really meant to 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 have a bro broad approach to justice uh, for children. If you have to have if you have to bring it back to its very core, then I think we have to talk about the we have to see the concept of child friendly justice as a concept that is meant to make the justice system more accessible, more accommodating, more responsive, and more accountable, and that accountability relates to remedy but also to empowerment. So the whole concept of child-friendly justice is meant to not only give access in a very practical sense to children, um, uh, but also to really invest in how we engage with children in the justice system, um, and not only effectively in the justice system, but also when they are already, they've left it again, but they still have to deal with the outcomes of it. Uh, and that is essentially coming back to this list of accessibility, accommodation, responsivity, accountability, remedies, and empowerment. This concept has ultimately led to uh, the Council of Europe's guidelines on child-friendly justice. I can recommend you to read that, but if you go through it, you see this comprehensive approach to justice engagement of children. It is again, part of a strong human rights framework building on international children's rights. So it's not invented in isolation. It is really building on a development of acknowledging children as actors in the justice system. It is about all justice pr proceedings, including, for example, in form all formal ones. It, it, it acknowledges that children engage with justice in many different ways, in different roles, but also uh, there is different stages uh, before you access justice while you're in the system and also after and particularly that after part is also fascinating it is for example clearly connecting to that accountability element uh, by providing that we have to explain to children carefully what the outcomes of the decisions are but also we have to make sure that they understand that their participation was an essential element of that outcome and that, that the decision maker can also explain to children what um, he or she did, what it did with the input that children provided along the way. 
And that is all about ultimately that accountability element. Key elements in this whole framework are information, accessibility of proceedings, legal and other assistance, the right to be heard, of course, as a cornerstone of international children's rights, which include, again, that feedback loop afterwards. Avoiding undue delay, time is absolutely critical for young people. Safe and child appropriateness in terms of the environment, in terms of the buildings, in terms of the uh, protocols, in terms of, of, of clothing, of, of, of decision makers. And there's still a lot to be explored. Language, of course, not only in terms of the language that you speak, but also language that children can actually understand, bearing in mind, for example, also certain uh, um, limited abilities or disabilities. And what we also know also from research is that the position of family and parents is critical. So we should not exclude uh, children from being connected to their family and those who are around them. Of course, sometimes there's very good reason to be very cautious there. But at the same time, we also know that for effective use of, um, of, of access to justice, um, those who are immediately around uh, children and those who are trusted by children are absolutely critical. When these were guidelines were prepared, children themselves also um, clearly stated that if they are seeking information, if they are seeking justice, they are first to go to those who they trust. And they often do not yet trust the system or they do not trust the system anymore. So this is critical, um, not only because it's a matter of principle and it's included in a human rights framework, but also we see already in research that if you invest in the inclusion of young people and children themselves in the system of justice, that it is much more likely that you get better outcomes, higher quality decisions, children can enrich the dialogue, for example, as the South African Constitutional Court already acknowledged years ago. Um, and it is also uh, connecting children much more to what we call procedural justice, is that they have the feeling that this justice decision is about them and that they have been part of it. And that also contributes to the credibility and uh, also their support for the outcomes. We need to talk about all children, um, uh, which is uh, quite a fundamental issue, but it would also mean that we have to acknowledge that child, the child does not exist and that within the group of children, um, we, we, have, we have stark differences uh, between age levels, but also developmental levels, abilities, and maybe also disabilities. And we have to deal with that in, in different ways. And in a way, we, we have to accommodate these differences without saying that um, uh, the children do not, all children do not have that right to access to justice as a starting point. But I understand, I assume that you understand what I mean. So it's acknowledging differences in, better, in order to better accommodate, yet it starts by acknowledging that everyone, every child has that right to access to justice. Some critical issues I think to think about, and then I will wrap up, is that we, we really need to talk about responsive, uh, the uh, responsivity of the system. The, the, and, and within that, of course, we are often talking about the professional within the system. So how do we, we invest in specialization, in the mindset? How do we make sure that we provide for adequate protection mechanisms in order to support children to participate effectively? So protection for participation, information, information, information. And there's many practical ways, I think, how to invest in that. I've worked on some of these issues myself. Uh, how can we really connect to children? So not only by bringing them in and giving them 10 minutes or five minutes of our time? And how do we really connect to children to how they see what is at stake? How do they feel about also what has been done? And, and ultimately, of course, do we, how do we make sure that within that system, we are having enough mechanisms to really hold, maybe particularly also ourselves as adults accountable for doing the right? Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, it, during the discussions, I could give you some more examples, but I think um, this is basically what I would, wanted to share with you today. 
Um, we need to rethink our systems. Of course, maybe we want to reimagine them, but in practice, of course, we have to accommodate children much more effectively. If we do that, we are investing not only in our children, but also in our systems. And that would also mean that we live up to our obligations internationally. And that is already a good argument to work on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ton. Um, and we do have um, some, um, we're probably doing quite well on, on the issue of time. So I know if uh, if later on in the in the session, Ton, you wanted to revisit some of your points or slides, uh, there may well be time for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you to Professor Leofard. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Professor Ursula Kilkelly. And of course, uh, as is customary with these webinars, uh, question and answer will follow both speakers and we'll go for roughly uh, half an hour. Um, allow me to introduce Professor Ursula Kilkelly. Um, Professor Ursula Kilkelly is at the School of Law, University College Cork, and has been researching international children's rights law for over 25 years. Her extensive publications, over 100 articles, book chapters, monographs and edited collections, address the legal implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, children's access to justice and children's rights in areas like healthcare, youth justice and detention and the arts. Ursula has undertaken collaborative and interdisciplinary research for multiple national and international organizations, and her work has had impact in translating rights into policy and practice. Ursula is co-editor of Youth Justice with Professor Stefan Plazier of KU Leuven, in Ireland, she chairs the Board of Management of Oberstown Ch Children Detention Campus, and in 2022 published with Bristol University Press, her book with Pat Bergen, Advancing Children's Rights in Detention, a Model for International Reform, documenting the process of translating rights into practice in youth detention. I'll hand you over to Professor Ursula Kilkelly. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you for that warm uh, introduction, Matthew, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure uh, to be to be with you. I'm very sorry, as I said to my son earlier, that I was off to Sydney. I'm very sorry that I'm not in Sydney uh, with you all. Um, I've spent um, a number of visits to, to Australia over the years and uh, watch your uh, development very keenly in the context of children's rights and youth justice and detention. And have learned a lot from people like Matthew and, and, and the Youth Law um, Centre and uh, indeed right across your uh, legal community. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all um, see this now. Um, that's our beautiful campus uh, in uh, the centre of Cork City. Um, and um, again, uh, thank you for, for allowing us to bring a little bit of Cork to, to uh, Australia and the world uh, this morning. I want to talk about access to justice, um, taking account of uh, the work that I've done and what I would call learn, learning from within, um, but also in collaboration. Um, a huge amount of the work that uh, I've done has been around the use of the law to advance children's rights. And um, while that has been um, focused on uh, supporting, collaborating and analyzing the work of, of organizations like Juvenile Law Center in Philadelphia, like uh, the Center for Child Law in Pretoria and the development of our own child law clinic in, in Cork, uh, we've got a real insight in through that work into how the law works uh, or doesn't work to advance children's rights, including their access to justice. Um, but when I was appointed to the Board of Management of Oberstown, our national detention facility, um, little did I know the challenges that lay ahead, both with regard to the work that Matthew mentioned at the outset, which is documented in our book, but also the challenge that we would face um, uh, it, being at the other end, if you like, of uh, children seeking access to justice um, through uh, litigation, uh, public inquiry, um, and accountability, all of which was entirely justified. Um, but it also gave me an, an understanding of what it's like to be at the other end um, and to interrogate a little bit more, perhaps, the value of the different mechanisms we have to advocate and advance the rights of children. 
Um, I've also just published a book with Emily Logan, Ireland's first ombudsman for children on national and independent children's rights institutions. And I've been doing an amount of work there too, looking at, again, a 360 view of how you make these mechanisms work better for children, um, taking account of the learning across, across those different dimensions. And, and like Tan, I was involved in the global study on children deprived of liberty. And again, this was a really interesting piece of work. We, with Laura Lundy uh, in Queens, my collaborator, um, worked to ensure that children's voices were heard through the global study, consulting internationally with children about their experiences of detention and bringing uh, something of an uncomfortable uh, truth, I think, to the global study about the reality of children's lives in detention. And some of that is at odds with the really important um, advocacy that needs to happen around detention. Um, and there's a, there's, but there was a, an experience of a, of a tension there that I think was really, really interesting for me. So, and we can talk about all this later, I think. Um, so I just wanted to share that that's the perspective I bring to, to the issues I'm going to talk about. Tan has set things up really brilliantly. Um, and I um, share all of the um, views that he has, has proposed around the challenges of this, both from a conceptual and from a practical point of view. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the, the reality of the experience from a children's point of view in the context of particularly linking uh, children's rights uh, to access to justice. There is um, a fundamental uh, interdependency between protecting and advancing children's rights and ensuring their access to justice. And as Tan said, we don't focus on that. The convention uh, actually doesn't articulate a right uh, to a remedy for children. And it is relatively weak on recognizing children as legal actors. Yes, it talks about participation, talks about legal representation, but it doesn't give children a right to uh, a legal standing in their own right, um, not explicitly at least. The committee has been very um, clear that remedies are linked to children's rights enforcement um, and recognizing that the challenges that Tan has outlined that create uh, real difficulties for them in pursuing remedies. And that states have a duty in addition to recognizing and implementing children's rights to providing those uh, procedures that enable children to claim those rights. So really without remedies, rights um, are often uh, left on the shelf or often abstract and un unclaimed. Um, and Tan has made the really important point about the fundamental support systems that must be around children for children to be able to claim those rights through remedies, through access to justice, um, really, and again, the committee calling out uh, child-friendly information, advice, advocacy, access to independent complaints, procedures, and to the courts with necessary legal or other assistance. The reality of that for children, though, is very far removed from what we would expect to see, given the clarity of the committee's um, guidance. Um, and, I, and it's worth, Tan has referenced the, 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 the sort of definition around access to justice um, for children. Um, and breaking it down, I think it's useful to think about what we mean by access and what we mean by justice. And uh, for children, um, in the context, again, of, of child-friendly justice, really we're talking about access um, where, where that is easily reached for children, but also easily used. So even if it may be um, easy to access the, the system of justice or the complaints mechanism, how easy is it to use? It must be trusted. And we fail repeatedly uh, to make our systems, our, our mechanisms, our complaints procedures um, worthy of children's trust. We don't reach out to them. We don't speak to children about their experiences. Um, and we don't ensure as a matter of priority that these mechanisms uh, are meet children where they are. And we have some experience of that in our detention centre, which I can, I can refer to later. Uh, they must also, given children's circumstances, be timely um, and they must be appropriate. So again, that sense of meeting children in their own circumstances, not expecting them to look and find um, a remedy. I think there's also a really interesting question when we talk about access to justice, about what justice means. What do we need um, apart from 
um, ensuring that children's rights are protected? Are we talking about restoring the rights of children? Um, it, it, in many instances, it's about reparation. How effective a remedy is that? Is that justice for children? Um, symbolic victories, often legal cases that win and seem to advance the, the, the law, um, may for the individual child involved be, uh, be an empty victory of sorts. Uh, and, and of course, many children, as we know through our research, um, are um, strong ambassadors for the rights of other children, children's rights defenders themselves seeking to reform um, the system so that they don't, uh, others don't experience what they have. Um, and I want to deal uh, briefly with what I see as four different mechanisms through which children can access justice and deal with some of the pros and cons of those from my experience, really um, to, to, to allow us to um, have, the, have a discussion later on about, the, about these issues. Um, if we look at litigation, and I have been a proponent of strategic litigation, I've been involved in strategic litigation, uh, over many many years, um, it's a crucial um, it's a crucial um, instrument to have in any toolkit, and I think particularly children's legal centres um, have a unique role to play in advocating and advancing the rights of children. Their advantages, yes, they hold government to account legally and in public. And having been the subject of litigation, I can tell you uh, it's it's a an experience that leaves its mark in terms of personal accountability, but also in terms of the public statement that it makes. Um, it's also um, uh, when that risk lands um, a very arresting moment um, that, that really draws attention to the unacceptability alleged or, or, or claimed of the practice in question. It can bring about reform uh, over time um, and as part of a wider strategy, and, and, and it is, though, I think, to some extent, best for really acute cases. And I've just given some examples there, solitary confinement, um, and, and you've had your own experiences of that most recently. Um, but how, how that gets tested um, is, is a matter for discussion. Um, disadvantages, I think we have to accept that litigation is not um, often in children's interest. It's not often accessible to children. It is often the adults um, valuable um, um, community and other law centres where um, campaigns and agendas, if you like, to reform the law um, seek out litigation as opposed to children themselves seeing this as an avenue. We are seeing some changes in that, particularly in the climate space, which is great to see, but it's really challenging for children, particularly in institutions, to see this as a viable um, opportunity or, or avenue for them. It can be slow and expensive. Uh, the work we did on, on the case of Louise O'Keefe, the, the um, survivor of uh, childhood abuse in the European Court of Human Rights, took 15 years. Um, and, and, and also, I think, interestingly, it's subject, of course, to applicable legal standards. And that makes it very challenging. We've seen some lack of success in cases that you might think would be obvious um, wins. Um, the remedies are not always time in effect, and I'll come back to that because I think that that is a real question um, um, uh, for, for, for those who propose litigation as to how we can make it effective in children's own terms. Um, moving on, to, and, I, and I think this is really critical, particularly to the detention context, to not forget the whole role that monitoring plays in, in providing and supporting children to access justice. Uh, the advantage is clearly that where it is regular, where it is independent, where it is robust, um, monitoring is fundamental to ensuring children's rights are protected. Um, over time, we can see whether it's the uh, international mechanisms of OPCAT or for, in Europe, the Committee for the Prevention of Torture or others, or whether it's your domestic inspector, it's really crucial um, that they can track reforms over time. I think from uh, the point of view of, of detention, just to, as an aside, it's fundamental that those organizations and state institutions uh, are embedded in the children's sector uh, rather than uh, the, the, the prison system, that they have that really clear understanding of what children's um, uh, rights is about and how to ensure children's voices are heard through the monitoring process. 
Um, it does enable uh, children in difficult situations to have safe access uh, to independent authority. And even the work we did for the global study, um, it was remarkable how willing children were to speak up about their experiences, um, both um, positive and also um, very, very negative. Um, is also linked to public scrutiny and plays a really important role in the state vindicating the rights of children, but also ensuring there is public awareness, media attention, and that advocacy can take place around the implementation of recommendations made through monitoring. I think it's a really interesting question as to what the disadvantages are then. Uh, they can arguably become detached and monitor, if you like, and inspect on their own terms, not connected to either children's rights standards or to the reality of detention experience, both for children and those who are managing those um, facilities. And they become uh, institutionalized in that way, in their own terms um, and, and not engaging sufficiently with, uh, with the children's rights framework. Um, the sort of visitor syndrome, you paint, paint the corridors, the inspectors will walk down, it can be easy to hide. Uh, and what happens when they're gone, both to the children who've spoken to the inspectors, but also to the multitude of recommendations and observations that they make. So clearly not a perfect system either. Uh, I know you've had, um, you, you, like Ireland, I think Australia has had, had um, um, a number of, of um, commissions of inquiry over the years in these areas. Um, and it's an interesting go-to, I think, uh, for, for both Ireland and Australia. And I've done a little bit of work, particularly around the Ryan report and our, our multitude of, of reports into children's treatment in, in industrial schools and institutional settings, looking at the value of these systems from a children's rights perspective. And we certainly see uh, that they are a public um, means of um, holding government to account. Um, they are and can be depending on how they're set up. And I was looking at the Tasmanian uh, inquiry recently um, in this context can be um, seen as accessible and inclusive ways to reach out to children, to hear their experiences, to give voice to those who have survived. delivering that accountability through, through a public process. Um, the disadvantages, I've just referenced there, a recent article on our Ryan report, um, too little, too late. We've, we've, um, um, there's an interesting debate going on a number of these mechanisms now at the moment, um, how politicized they can become. That's both, of course, an advantage and a disadvantage. How do you ensure that these um, mechanisms um, provide appropriate and fair reparation um, and, and equally then, um, how do you ensure that that meets with the individual needs and rights of those who've been impacted? Um, the recommendations uh, tend to reach for systemic failure from time to time. And I think that's a question where those who want individual or some other level of more meaningful accountability. Um, and I was struck looking at this over the last few days, how, how the Royal Commission, in the context of, of the Northern Territory at least, recommend the prohibition of, of, uh, of spit hoods and so on um, coming out of, of the Don Dale experience. And yet that is still being resisted, being uh, worked through by, by uh, long term implementation. So a question about impact, I think, uh, notwithstanding those advantages. Um, I think, though, when you talk to children and young people themselves um, about what access to justice means for them, their um, uh, most, I think, appropriate and most um, uh, meaningful mechanism is a complaint system. Um, a complaint mechanism that is accessible to children, that, is, uh, that meets them where they are, and that focuses on immediate restoration of their rights, um, really can provide a very effective um, response to children's rights violations and breaches. Um, it is in an institutional setting, and we've experienced this ourselves, something that can really strengthen a culture of trust among children and young people, where they see that they're taken seriously, that their concerns will be heard and will be addressed. Um, and um, 
and, and done done well and done where children are at, I think can be really, really powerful. Um, of course, this is difficult to do well. Um, we've done an amount of work on this in the context of uh, both international and, and national complaint mechanisms. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't underestimate how embedding them in organizations um, can, can be uh, difficult. We uh, published a guide with our Irish Ombudsman for Children a number of years ago, building on the work that we had done, in particular, uh, children's rights analysis that I had done of children's complaints to our national institution. I came up with um, a series of, of principles that should guide uh, any mechanism for complaints handling, that it be open and accessible, that it focus on children's interests, uh, hear and, and engage with children directly, uh, be transparent and, and be clear about how the system will work, how the process will work, the feedback you'll receive, expectations around what can be addressed and what cannot, perhaps. Um, being aware of, of the passage of time. Uh, many times have we heard about how long processes can take, really damaging children's trust and faith in our justice system. Um, they must be fair, um, both in terms of being inclusive and and taking an individualized approach. Um, and there is a need also for the institution, the body, the organization, and the state to constantly monitor what they're learning from complaints, um, reviewing those complaints and ensuring con continuous improvement. But done well, uh, these kind of complaints um, mechanism, uh, whether it's in the police system, whether it's in, in the court system, whether it's in detention settings, whether it's in schools, our communities can be a really effective way of advancing the rights of children, creating a better um, understanding and trust among children and uh, that their voices will be heard and their rights um, taken seriously. Um, to conclude, I, I just uh, want to reiterate those main points um, that the children um, as rights holders in the state as duty bearer, we, we often um, uh, rightly hold the state to account uh, for a failure to protect children's rights. We don't often reflect the reality that where that happens, particularly uh, where you have very serious breaches of rights on a systemic level, that that also includes a failure to ensure children have had access to justice. Um, it is something that often happens after the fact to remedy the, the rights breaches um, rather than um, addressing them as an integrated part of children's rights implementation. Um, and really, as systemic issues, I think access to justice as part of the response to any children's rights violation rarely gets the attention that it needs. Um, certainly, my, my work and that of others, colleagues in, in this space have, have made very clear uh, that these mechanisms have to be embedded throughout the justice system. They have to be partnered with young people in their development um, if we are, if we are um, uh, committed to ensuring that they are not just appropriate and effective, that they are trusted by the children and young people who ultimately they must serve. And that's a final point I would make, uh, given the enormous importance of advocacy generally in children's rights, that the advocacy focuses as much on these mechanisms as systemic ways to embed children's rights protections uh, into our justice system, they become as important as the advocacy for the substantive rights protection as well. Uh, so I'll leave it there. I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, and to um, answering questions and, and, and hearing what you all have to say. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much, Ursula. And thank you very much, Ursula and Ton, for those really fascinating and terribly interesting uh, presentations. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please um, place your questions in the chat and we'll get to them in order. Um, Rutaba, if you wouldn't mind also keeping an eye on the, the gallery of images in case after the chat, there are some folks putting their hands up. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, questions in the chat. I'll turn firstly uh, to Danny. Um, Forgive me, I seem to have lost the chat momentarily.
while I'm finding Danny's question, um, I, ladies and gentlemen, we've been joined today uh, by Tom Firm at 7.30 in the Netherlands um, and Ursula at 6.30 in Ireland. So uh, firstly, thank you both very much for, for being with us at, at such a shocking hour. I do believe that you may have to go uh, precisely on time. So ladies and gentlemen, um, do get your questions in. So um, Danny's question is, are there examples of countries that are demonstrating best practice or at least some elements of best practice? Um, I think this is a great question for both of you. So starting with Tom. Yeah, sure. It's a good question indeed. Of course, it, ultimately, I think we can learn a lot from each other. So I think that exchange is extremely important. Um, we haven't that many examples of where there is a really comprehensive um, uh, approach to 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 access to justice so it, it's still rather fragmented but um what is quite interesting to see is that when these th this concept emerged in the european uh, uh, region uh, both the council of europe and the european union included it in its um in in, in its agenda uh, on on children's rights and and for those not from europe we have two kinds of europe eh? so we have the european union now um 27 member states and the Council of Europe, it's it's bigger, it's a human rights Europe, so to say, and it has 47 member states, which even includes, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, many of the former Soviet Union uh, uh, countries. So, so that's bigger, but okay, that, that's a bit on the side, but the, the issue is that because they included it in the international agendas around child rights, um, um, there was quite a movement around child-friendly justice, and that also led to funding, particularly of civil society organizations, to invest time in elements of child-friendly justice, for example, around training of professionals, or about the setting up of social uh, legal services, or, um, by, you know, by investing in, for example, um, multidisciplinarity on how to assess, for example, children's needs and children's uh, uh, interests. And, and so I think if you zoom in on Europe, you see many examples of where elements of child-friendly justice have been developed further, have been brought to, 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 domestic, uh, to the domestic level, and that, that, that could provide some powerful example. But again, the comprehensive nature of these efforts is still very limited in my view. Another very interesting development in my view is that courts have started to experiment with what we could call child-friendly judgments. So they've tried to include either in their judgment or, as, um, 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 or, uh, or through a letter in addition to a formal judgment, they've tried to explain in, in more child-friendly, child-accessible uh, language what the decision was about. And that um, UK judges have been very powerful there. In the Netherlands, it's happening. Um, uh, in, in, in Scotland, uh, there's there some movement there. So, so I think there's there is examples of these kind of practices that we could could benefit from. Of course, another issue, and then I stop and I hand over to Ursula, is is that of course throughout the globe you have seen already quite a long time quite some investment in child interrogation rooms. Yeah, so, for example, to accommodate child victims much more and much better in the justice system, and that is really a movement around the globe. So in Latin America, there are examples. Uh, um, I, I'm not so in, into Australia, I'm afraid, but but maybe you could could give me examples of that. But I assume that that is uh, that that may also be uh, been picked up here, um, in in Australia. I mean, Ursula, I think you've taken all my examples, Tom. Um, that <laughs> I think the children's houses is a really good example, and I, and. And I, and I of how um, progressive um, approaches and, and different thinking is required around children's access to justice. Um, where, and again, this, there's a lot written on this, and this has ended up in the European strategies um, as well. Um, and and I, what, I, what I would just say, I suppose, is that there are um, in different contexts really good, good um, examples. Uh, so those who run, for example, really, really strong uh, child-friendly courts. Um, uh, there are others who run very effective complaints mechanisms. Um, there are varying standards of national institutions for children, uh, not all of which are equally effective, but I think we're starting to see what is working in that context. Um, and and the, 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 the markers, I suppose, of what works 
uh, is frequently around their connectedness, their their um, um, ability to engage with children and ensure that children trust the systems that are that are in place. And NGOs um, and both and community groups are absolutely vital to bridging that gap. Um, and that's where we see, I think, where where it works most effectively. We don't probably document enough. Actually, some of the topic topic Tom and myself are, are working on um, at the moment. Thank you, Ursula. And Mutaza, I see your hands up. I'll just take one more question in the chat and then go to you. Thank you. Um, so actually, Danny, again, uh, interested to hear effective models of accountability. Australia doesn't seem to do this very well. Um, years on from the Northern Territory Royal Commission, we have seen little progress. Um, so does do models of accountability for implementation of things like a, a Royal Commission recommendations uh is that something that lives within the conception of children's rights and access to justice I, i'll go first on this one if, if you like don i mean i think um i think i mean i i flagged a few the few of the challenges with with commissions of inquiry uh in in this area um they're hugely valuable for um articulating giving voice to to the hidden and um, breaches of children's rights. Um, they become um, sometimes an end in themselves. Um, and we haven't seen, I think, great um, implementation plans around commissions of inquiry. And that's where things fall down, in my experience. Uh, we had a very interesting, um, again, this often comes down to people. We had a very interesting experience with our Ryan uh, Commission of Inquiry, which was a 10 year long process of exploring um, and, and hearing from those who had survived institutions in Ireland. Um, the government um, um, moved ahead with what became at the Ryan implementation plan. It was a whole swathe of policy and legal and other institutional reforms that really didn't have much grounding in the commission at all. The commission's recommendations had been quite symbolic in nature, um, but there was a real intent to use the Ryan process to advocate for much more robust systems of uh, mechanisms for protecting and advancing children's rights in the context of, of justice for children, including uh, those children who had not received justice. So that was an interesting example, I think, of how you how you push forward through a commission of inquiry beyond the recommendations. I mean, I think um, it's an interesting when I was looking at looking at the, you know, the the recommendations. Um, as I said, in, in relation to the Royal Commission, um, you know, but there, there's got to be um, significant advocacy around um, implementation of recommendations that come out of these inquiries, um, or else they do unfortunately gather gather dust, and that's. Where, the, where all of our work is so critically important um, and where I'm sure there is very strong um, um, uh, you know, concerted efforts happening collaboratively to, to push forward on implementation of recommendations. One of the only, only points I would make, a uh, final point I would make here relates to the risk, I suppose, of addressing recommendations or addressing what the Commission of Inquiry has considered in isolation. Um, and I know from, from the work of John Tobin and others around the, the resistance that children's rights can receive in Australia, it's not unique in that respect, but culturally, um, as well as legally, there it is very difficult to promote implementation of recommendations where they go somewhat against the political grain. And, and I think while that is a the challenging process, uh, it does point to more uh, the need for more systemic reform, but also uh, a wider process of engagement and collaboration and advocacy around public attitudes. And we've, we've done an amount of work to try and shift the shift public thinking. And um, but also, and I know this is this is ongoing, there's a really interesting piece in the International Journal of Children's Rights recently from, from Waltz and, and um, Fitzgerald around this in terms of balancing rights, but having those debates about the wider context in which the recommendations must be implemented is really crucial. Thanks, Ursula. Ton, have you seen effective models of accountability in relation to the implementation of, of these types of inquiries in, in the Netherlands or elsewhere? No, I, 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 I don't think I have to 
add too much to what Ursula just said, but we, we had such an inquiry in our country, um, very uh, unaccessible because it's all in Dutch, but a, 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 an impressive list of recommendations. And I think clearly around uh, changing norms uh, uh, when it comes to protection, protecting children. Um, substantively, we look differently at children also in care, and I think rightfully so. But what really comes out of it is that there is a lack of transparency of our care system. There is no way uh, of children accessing remedies, uh, seeking help, finding information to, to basically draw the attention to their position. And, and what is then quite um, um, yeah, worrying to see is that, of course, the substantive violations get all the attention. But we need to talk also about how we make the system more accountable. And that is, I think, still a critical misstep that we make all the time. And then if you only talk about substantive rights, you are very much dependent on the will of, of the political power or whatever, you know, to, to make changes. Um, uh, but we, we need the vehicles to put pressure on the system and to make the system more accountable. And I think that is still an absolutely critical step that we often still um, uh, ig ig you know, ignore or, or not give uh, the attention that it should get. And that is actually connecting to, the, to one of the final points that Ursula made in her presentation is that we also internationally, uh, yes, we need to talk about substantive rights of children, but we need to talk about the procedural rights as well, connecting uh, these also to the, to the to the accountability of the of the systems that, that are ultimately there to, to protect children's rights. Um, if, if I can take you to the international level, there, there is something happening there as well. Eh? So we have now this, this international communications procedure for children, so they can complain uh, directly to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And of course, not all the countries have connected to that system yet, um, uh, a little bit more than 40 countries in the world, but there is a, already quite an interesting body of case law emerging from that, that is not only about substantive rights, but also about procedural rights. It's also about real remedies. And, and those countries that have been involved there, they are already moving into the direction of, of systemic change. For example, in the context of migration, there are quite interesting examples from Spain where they, for example, um, changed uh, uh, the way they deal with, with refugees from Northern Africa and in their educational system, for example. So, so there is really something happening, but it's moving slowly. And I think my criticism towards the Committee on the Rights of the Child um, is, is that it doesn't comprehensively approach and, and, and engage with um, access to justice. Uh, um, it, it, is, it is still, uh, also if you look at the concluding observations to Australia, the attention for the, for the elements of access to justice is, you know, it's there, but it's very fragmented. It's about the right to be heard. There is some reference to victims and redress um, um, a victim, you know, there's something on redress for victims of sexual violence. There is something on information for child victims and uh, uh, of domestic violence, and there's some information on on, on, the, on redress for children in the conf in conflict with the law who have been abused. But that's it. Yeah? So if you go carefully through the work of the committee, you still that also the committee doesn't fully engage with it yet. So I think there is still a lot of work to to be done. It's a bit of an elaborated answer to the, the question on on inquiries, but I think this is this is where we are right now. Thanks, Tom. So um, they were both amazing answers, and it sounds like really interesting work coming out of out of the optional protocol. I'm sure there may be some questions on that particular document. Um, I have um, Mataza and Lucy uh, waiting for questions. Mataza was first with your hand up. Um, thank you, Mataza. If you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi everyone, thank you. Thanks for your great presentation. Uh, I'm Morteza Mahiki. Uh, well, I was professor of law and human rights uh, defender in Afghanistan after Taliban takeover. I lost my career, academic career. Uh, now I'm a scholar in exile. Mm, I want to ask uh, your opinion, your suggestion about you now uh, 
human rights uh, situation in Afghanistan, how, you know, what we can do, we means uh, scholar in ex exile, Afghan ex scholar in exile, what we can do to improve uh, children human rights in Afghanistan. Uh, I want to, you know, your suggestion, your opinion about this. Thank you, Mataza, and thank you for sharing um, your story. Um, what a, a profoundly um, important topic. Um, such a big question. Um, Ton, Ursula, which of you would like to um, first have a, a crack at answering Mataza's question? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mataza, for, for sharing it. Um, it's, a, it's a complex question, of course, and um, I think the whole conversation that we have had so far this morning uh this afternoon for you is 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 is, is um I, I mean it's not very useful in it when a country is really turned upside down and 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 where you basically have to 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 work on much more fundamental human rights challenges than 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 uh, there may be the question on how to include children in a, in a justice system that essentially works and is there and etc but I think, nevertheless, we need to talk about children's rights in these um, in these very complex crises, and that's what we see also um, in the most difficult circumstances. International children's rights give a narrative to prioritize children, to address girls' rights, for example, to draw the attention of those uh, to the kind of, of of the of the governments or or or, or the international community to the essential services that should be provided to children in, 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 in conflict. Um, and, and I think you, you can see that in Syria, you can see that in, 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 uh, in, in Africa, you can see it in, in Central America and in the, in the crises that are there. Um, with children's rights as a narrative, we can prioritize children's interests and invest in, in essential um, uh, services, but also address fundamental human rights violations, including, for example, uh, discrimination, um, uh, for example, against women, like in your country. Um, so so, so I, I tend to say we have to support, for example, international organizations like UNICEF, like Save the Children, like uh, Terre des Hommes, like, like uh, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, to, to, you know, to, to let them do their work in these most challenging circumstances. Uh, but quite soon after that, we need to talk about children and how to include them also in our processes. Uh, and and that, is, that is connecting to our conversation. So even in these circumstances, how do we make sure that we also do um, uh, justice to the children as actors in these processes? So, um, so, so that would be my answer to your very complex question. Um, but but I, uh, I appreciate that you ask it anyway, because we, we need to have these conversations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ton. Uh, Ursula? Yeah, I'd add a couple of things to that. Thank you, Matad. That's really um, important to, to ground us in, in, in your reality um, when we're having these conversations. Um, and increasingly, I think there is a discussion going on, perhaps prompted um, by, by both Afghanistan, but also for us in Europe by, by Ukraine. Um, with regard to what value children's rights instruments like the convention have in the context of these really stark challenges to, to children's rights and to human rights. Uh, testing, I think, the uh, commitment um, of, of both us as scholars, but also um, of governments to uh, advocate consistently for um, the implementation of these conventions, notwithstanding the really challenging circumstances on the ground. Um, I think there's a couple of things I would add to what Tana said. One is um, the, the need to document, the need to, to, to um, ensure that we are capturing the experiences, the lived experiences of children of their rights uh, in Afghanistan and, and in other countries where, where that is possible to do through the collaboration with the international organizations that, that Tan has mentioned. Um, we can never then say we did not know, and I think that's sometimes all we can do. Um, I think there's part of that, though, and, and, and related is, is what we do as, as, as academics in our teaching, 
ensuring that these issues are brought to the attention of students, that there is an awareness among the student community, um, that they can galvanize and, and advocate and, and discuss these issues with, with their peers. And that's, that's a powerful force, the student body, um, for, um, for raising awareness. And we've seen how young people have led the way in the context of climate discussions. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, and related to that, of course, the whole work that, that the body of children's rights defenders and that the committee is doing to ensure that children themselves are advocates for the rights of other children um, around the world. Um, so I, I think um, those are the elements I'd add. Um, and I would, I would say also, and particularly as the editor of a journal, um, it's really important that we have um, this work coming through the academic community, um, whether it's through scholars at risk programs um, or through, through more gr greater access to and greater diversity in what we, uh, what we research, what we publish, so that these really important challenges are addressed in, in sometimes the only way we as academics know how, and that is through debate, discussion, analysis, and raising awareness all the time. But thank you so much for raising that really important question. Thank you both, and thank you, Mataza. I have um, Lucy and Vahid coming up, um, but I did have one question of my own to follow up. Um, the language of child rights programming is a language that's used by aid organisations, uh, and uh, the the role of aid organisations uh, in uh, countries in conflict, and with particular reference to Afghanistan, uh, was mentioned in, in briefly. I'm wondering to what extent um, that procedural approach of aid organisations in country uh, is supportive of children's rights generally and access to justice specifically in countries in conflict. And for, for members of the audience who aren't familiar with that phrase, um, as I understand it, it connotes the process by which an aid organisation like UNICEF or Save the Children um, undertakes its programs in conformity, in this case, with um, a children's rights based approach. Um, Ursula. Yeah, I, I don't have a huge amount to say on that point. It's a really interesting one. And actually, for me, it speaks to the question of who we're holding accountable. Um, there's always a risk when we talk about children's rights um, being everybody's responsibility that we forget that the state is the duty bearer, but there are also bodies like the international organizations and NGOs that have huge power um, in communities, but also globally and at a political level. And they must be speaking both the language and the substance of children's rights. And that I would say is still a work in progress. That's really all I would say. I, I echoed it. I echo that. And, and, and sometimes it's understandable that it is not at the forefront of people's concern, but I think the international aid organizations still need to invest in their own in their own way of including children. That is absolutely obvious. However, much has already been done also. Eh? So there, there is a lot of attention for, for child safeguarding, for example, much more than before. When the COVID pandemic emerged, uh, you know, the first signs of, you know, reimagining and rebuilding was also about child participation. So there is a lot happening. Um, I can share some links on, 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 on child safeguarding there as well. But, uh, but I think also there we still have to move on. And that is also uh, move, move further. And that's also because within these organizations, there are professionals and these professionals are not always so connected to what we discussed today. So that's that's where also uh, the investment has to be made. Um, so thanks for that question. Thank you both very much. The next question comes from Lucy. Uh, Professor Leofard mentioned to think beyond formal and criminal justice systems. Are there some examples of how child-friendly practices can be adopted within informal justice systems? Absolutely, Lucy. Good to, to see you this morning. Um, the, um, I mean, informality uh, should be defined as well. And, and to a certain extent, you could think of, for example, customary law uh, practices. Uh, so, 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 so the systems that exist next to the more formal justice systems, but we could also think about informality within form the formal systems. So for example, I think um, one of the other participants is also referring to, to um, MEDA, uh, to de decentralized access to justice, for example. 
bringing access to justice closer to children could also result to a higher degree of informality, which could make a system more accessible. Um, and so that is important uh, to start with. Um, informality should not stand in the way of ultimately seeking formality, because we sometimes need formality also to really hold duty bearers to account. So it is never a way of saying, well, um, we should mediate and, and be informal as much as we can and therefore avoid accountability because ultimately sometimes you need that formality to push really uh, uh, through. Uh, having said that, I think good examples can be found in Africa, really. Um, the African Child uh, Policy Forum has published, and I, it was in my slides, um, earlier on uh, a, a report on uh, informal justice systems um, and it's called Spotlighting the Invisible and, and that is a very important and, and powerful source where you see that um, not only that there is something happening around um, ac securing access to justice in informal justice system but in addition to that um, uh, it also identifies uh, what kind of informal justice system we need to talk about when we when we when we uh, connect access to justice to informal systems. So I think that would be a great source. Spotlighting the invisible. I can give the the link in a minute. Um, um, it, it is a powerful source. Um, there are also UNICEF sources that you may want to rely on from UNICEF country offices. Um, um, and I think uh, that is absolutely something to uh, to to engage with also. Um, 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 on the long run. Thank you, Ton. And that was a nice segue because we have Vahid Hediati from UNICEF asking the next question. Your hands up, Vahid, um, if you'd unmute yourself. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening from Tehran, depending on where you are. I am Vahid Hediati, Child Protection Officer in Iran. And my at first, I should thank you for collaborating and for co coordinating this great meeting. Uh, my question is related to what dear Mortaza asked. Well, actually, whatever we are talking about so far, and most of the publications and literature regarding access to justice for children revolves around this uh, development context. But when, when it comes to humanitarian context and the crises, we, we have different things. So my, my question is just a one line question and it's, it looks simple. Are we, are we having the same principles and safeguards for access to, to justice for children in both humanitarian and development contexts? Do we have any best practices when it comes to uh, safeguarding and guaranteeing access to justice for children in human? humanitarian context as well, for example, in Australia, in Ireland, in Netherlands. Thank you, over from my side. Thank you, Vahid. Who would like to take this question on first? The answer is absolute yes. Um, but of course, you need to overcome different challenges and I understand that is absolutely understandable. But in terms of principles and mechanisms, I think much can be shared. And that is relating to the very, yeah, the very content of what access to justice is about. And that is about that real connection with children. That is about accommodation. It's about responsivity. It's about accountability. And that is not so much different in a developing context compared to a developed context. Of course, we, we must acknowledge that sometimes life is, is, is maybe easier in a developed world. At the same time, I'm not so sure because it's very difficult also to challenge existing perceptions, existing practices, existing laws. And sometimes you want to do it again. You want to redesign it, reimagine it. And that is, of course, the potential that the developing world has. However, challenges are big. In, I mean, of course, honestly, the question about Afghanistan, the question is, where do you start? But in terms of including children in your processes, in, 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 in the rebuilding of systems, um, it is also providing a huge opportunity to do it differently. So I would say principles and rights are absolutely having the same meaning. But of course, challenges have to be acknowledged, and that comes with different strategies. So it's more, more a matter of strategy than uh, principle. 
Ursula, the no, universality I, of rights is. Yeah, say that again. Is is this an example of the universality of rights? Yeah, or or, or, or not? Um, I mean, I think um, I I think one of the really interesting, perhaps more academic sides to to that question is is how children's rights interfaces interacts speaks to humanitarian law speaks to um, uh, you know cl climate environmental law speaks to. Um, uh, international criminal law. There are a whole, the intersection between children's rights and other, if you like, legal systems internationally. Um, the, the SDGs is a very good example. Where are children's rights in the SDGs? And, and there's an interesting debate about, about that and where accountability lies with the, with the process of SDGs, uh, where we actually have a robust legal um, system of accountability with human rights. And equally then, I think, and I've done some work in health, which might be of interest to you, where, where I look at the, the different um, approaches that are taken to child health in, in its uh, UN context and children's rights to health. Um, and, and how we don't speak the language of rights when we're talking about children's health, for instance. So I think there's a really interesting academic question there, but I think also I'm happy to share those resources um, with you if that's of use. And, and I've just put in the chat, to Tan's point about building this from 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 if you like the ground up and from children's own perspectives, a piece of work we did with Save the Children on children's involvement in public decision making, which really um, illuminates I think some examples of how children have a lot to say and to contribute to these processes. We have to have them uh, um, ensure that their voices are heard as part of of the rebuilding in any context. South Africa is a great example of that, of course, going back decades now. But the the yielding of of a, of a specific children's rights provision in the constitution that has led to a whole swathe of reforms from a constitutional a court point of view coming from children's original involvement in that the peace process and, and what preceded it. Thank you, Ursula. We're coming close to time. We have two more questions from Meda and Lindsay, um, which I'll direct one of those questions to each of you from Meda. Uh, discussions about access to justice often gravitate around the court system. I'm glad in this web webinar the discussion of decentralised access to justice and look further than to include other processes, including NHRIs, monitoring, etc. How can we mainstream access to justice for children at all the levels that matter to them, such as education, health, care, protection systems, consumer protection, etc.? Um, so that one for you, Ursula. Yeah, for me, this this is the fundamental question in a way uh, is about mainstreaming. This is not about those unique situations. It's about every context in which children uh, face um, threats or breaches of their rights, where they seek to claim their rights in a, in a more positive sense. That's why I believe that that complaints mechanisms are fundamentally important um, in schools, uh, in in local uh, communities, in every context in which children come into contact with authority, with decision makers, um, with adults. Uh, sports clubs, um, schools, I think, are, are and health, health um, environments, health, health uh, settings are crucial areas. We're really, really poor at ensuring that children have a way to and a means to, to both express their view about their experience and their treatment and responding to it by way of complaint, incredibly poor. Um, and I think that's an area where, where we're doing an amount of work at the moment, developing um, an awareness about actually where, as, as Eleanor Roosevelt has said, the small spaces where children's rights are routinely breached, that's where we need our complaints mechanisms. Thank you, Ursula. I can thoroughly endorse that observation as a, as a generalist law centre for children across Australia. Um, we see rights violations occurring at schools, in health contexts, in families, of course, uh, in all sorts of environments. And it does seem to us that uh, the question of access to justice in all those environments is often neglected by other players in the system. The next question is from Lindsay, and this one's for you, Tom. Uh, you may have heard of our uh, New South Wales Suspect Target Management Plan, STMP, where people are placed on a somewhat secret list and are closely monitored by police. I've seen this used as a tool to monitor Aboriginal children here, have you come across police programs like this implemented elsewhere targeting vulnerable children? So this is a preventative policing program called the STMP. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for that. Um, 
yes. Um, maybe Ursula can add to that. And I'm not entirely sure about England as we speak. Um, but we certainly have seen that in other countries, um, not only so much related to, for example, belonging to um, ethnic minorities, or, although that was included at a certain point in my country, for example, as well, um, but more to, um, at a certain point, our police held a list where, which, called, which we called the top 600, in which there was this this list of young um, um, adolescents and young adults that were seen as those who were need, in need of most of our attention. But ultimately, of course, it was mainly a list to target a specific group of young people and to, to really fo follow them closely with all kinds of surveillance instruments, etc. So the access to justice question is, how can you maybe, um, how, may, how, may, how can you challenge a list like this and how can you challenge your your inclusion as a, as a, as a child in that list. Um, clearly, um, well, if I, if I take it from the question as it was in the chat, um, um, on the basis of your Aboriginal background, um, of course, which can be challenged, of course, uh, seriously. So, so, so yes, it happens more. Um, uh, there are other issues related to this, but, but this is definitely a good example of where you, um, you would need uh, mechanisms to challenge, uh, in this particular case, the police. And that, again, is an example of where complaints commit, uh, mechanisms come in. Come in. Um, if I may just add one line to Ursula's feedback, I fully echo her, uh, her, her answer to Meda Kausen's question. But, but in addition to that, it shows that we, not, we don't only talk about access to justice um, in relation to the state, but also to, to the private uh, sector and, and to the non-state actors. Um, and because education, consumer protection, it's also about the private sector. It's also about the community. It's also about schools. It's about maybe even family and parents, uh, which was also, by the way, acknowledged by the committee when it addressed Australia in its concluding observations. So you can see a reference there as well. Um, but um, all right, so that would be my, my answer to Lindsay. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you uh, very much, everyone, for joining us. I know it's quite possible that our guests have to leave, uh, heading off to meetings, I think, uh, 9 o'clock in the Netherlands, 8 o'clock in Ireland. Uh, if you can, uh, Tom and Ursula, um, see us after the event, that'd be great, but if not, we'd love saying goodbye to you now. Uh, would you please all put your thanks into the chat for Tom and Ursula for what has been an absolutely sensational hour and a half discussing um, something that doesn't get quite the oxygen it deserves, but which is an absolutely essential safeguard to the rights of all children, and that is their, their right to access justice. Um, so thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ursula. Can I also thank DTP? Uh, Rutaba and Mubashar have been uh, piling the chat with an amazing litany of resources. I am so excited to dive into that, and I think you'll all find that um, the resources there, a, a rich uh, and engaging set of resources. On behalf of myself, Matthew Keeley at Youth Law Australia, the Diplomacy Training Program, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights and our colleagues at the University of New South Wales and our various academic supporters elsewhere, can I thank you all for joining us from all over the globe uh, and hope you have a wonderful evening uh, or a fabulous day. Uh, thanks everyone, bye.
and I just say goodbye because I need to uh, virtually run to another meeting. Um, yeah. And goodbye, the, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for moderating. It was absolutely wonderful and, oh, and organized. It was a yeah. stunning conversation. So thank you. We're sorry to keep you. And I just wanted to say a special thank you and look forward to hopefully um, talking to you again on, on other topics throughout the course of the of the program. But thank you for getting up so it's early. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It was wonderful. And Matthew. Uh, thank yeah. you, Ursula. We've really enjoyed having you both. Goodbye, Tom. Um, yeah. And Ursula, are you, do you have to rush off quite so quickly? No, no, I'm okay. Fantastic. I, I'm sure that some of, our, some of the colleagues who are still you know, participants in the chat are, you know, may well have gone off to get a cup of tea, but just wanted to say a nice is to see you again and uh, <laughs> you too, to again. Australia sometime soon. Uh, the next opportunity. <laughs> well, we're, always, uh, we're always looking for an opportunity, to be honest. Uh, good. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. I, 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 made, I did my best to, um, as you know, we pulled the details of the of the webinar together um, a little bit later than normal as we were juggling holidays and, and different time zones. Um, but I did um, promote it to colleagues uh, in the government in Tasmania, but also in Western Australia, uh, which are pro and the Northern Territory, of course, which are the three jurisdictions where issues about detention are um, yeah. um, likely to be discussed right now, although they're, they're, you know, the issues are rife um, throughout Australia. So I don't know. Maybe you might get a, an email from someone saying, "Hey, um, I would love, I would love, I would absolutely love that engagement." Um, I mean, it's it's just fascinating to see, and and I actually meant to mention. I thought it was really interesting in the um, in the press release in relation to the the recent case, the the, um, the Western Australia case, 